All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Monica Cardella, and along with Brent Jessic, um, we are co-chairs for Chanel Beebe's um, dissertation, and we are delighted to welcome you this morning to Chanel's defense. Um, we are gonna have uh, Chanel present her work for about 40 to 45 minutes. Um, so the first chunk is a public presentation. And then after that, we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for um, you all as uh, the public audience to ask any questions you might have. And then um, at about 1130, uh, we will ask you to uh, leave the Zoom meeting so that uh, Chanel's committee can talk with her for a little bit. Um, and so that's uh, generally our plan for this morning is we're gonna spend about 40, 45 minutes hearing from Chanel about her work. We'll have about 10, 15 minutes for you as the audience to ask questions. And then the second half of it is gonna be time just um, Chanel and her committee talking about her work. Um, but before I hand it over to Chanel, um, I just want to, to share with you all, um, I think you all know Chanel as a, as a researcher. I know many of you know many other dimensions of her work and her life too. Um, but I do just want to celebrate uh, the many, many different things she's done in the past few years uh, during her time at Purdue. Um, so you may know that Chanel started as a, a research associate for the Inspire Research Institute for Pre-College Engineering, um, working with us on pre-college related work. Um, Chanel also spent time working with the mechanical engineering department on a study of African-American students' experiences in engineering at Purdue. Um, she was a scholar in residence for the, the Black Thought Collective through the Black Cultural Center. Um, she also, another huge contribution was her work developing cultural hackathons um, for Purdue students, as well as for community members and community partners. Um, Chanel has partnered with different museums with that work, as well as worked with other universities for them to adopt that same model of allowing students to have um, culturally aligned, culturally sustaining design experiences. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. You might also know that Chanel is an artist and an entrepreneur. Chanel participated in the Applied Management Principles program during her time at Purdue. Chanel has her own business, BB Arts, um, where she does com community art projects. Um, she launched a magazine. She partners with the Detroit Historical Museum. Um, you may know she has uh, multiple collections of her poetry that are available, um, as well as uh, paintings that she has created. Uh, <clears throat> Chanel also served the engineering education community at Purdue. Um, she served as a secretary and president of the Engineering Education Graduate Student Association while she was uh, a graduate student. And then finally, more recently, um, especially for those of you who are thinking about what types of roles could somebody do with a PhD in engineering education. In the past few months, design, uh, Chanel has worked as a design researcher with the Greater Good Studio, which is based in Chicago, and is now a design researcher working with Ford. Um, so I just wanted to share all that with you so that we can celebrate not only the work that she's presenting today as part of her dissertation, but so that we could also celebrate the many, many, many other accomplishments um, and contributions that she's made. Um, with that, I'm delighted to now pass it over to Chanel so she can share her research with all of us. So thank you, Chanel. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am full of emotion this morning. Um, and of course, making last minute edits to my slides. So let me stop that, save it and close it. Um, thank y'all so much for joining me. I think I have until what time, Monica? Uh, so uh, about 45 minutes from now, so that would be about 11. Um, I'm sorry, the math, 11.22. Yeah, thank you. I wasn't about to try to math with these emotions. I appreciate it. Uh, 11.22. Okay. Um, I just want to get my thank yous out before I get into the document, because um, I think after the document, it'll be even harder to do. <laughs> Um, so thank you to everyone who was here. Thank you to my advisor for that amazing introduction um, and for seeing me so clearly this whole time. Um, thank you for Brent and the time that you have been on this committee um, and the energy and, and 
organization that you've contributed to my document and study, but also just to me as a researcher. Um, first, I guess, thank God. Um, thank God and my family and my grandmother. Thank y'all for joining me. I, hear, I see y'all. I see my phone blowing up. I appreciate y'all. Um, thank you to my mother and my father who have inspired and supported me so deeply. Um, to my little brother who made all of my reasons so very clear. Um, to my grandmothers. Just to my grandmother. Um, to my friends, to the grad students who made this possible for real, for real, who talked me through this, to James, um, to Ronald, to Delhi, um, to Kina, Fantasy, Monique, all of y'all. Thank y'all for this work. Um, thank y'all for the work y'all did in me. Thank y'all for allowing me to say what I'm about to say. Um, to the rest of my committee, thank y'all for your patience, for your uh, continued support. Um, and thank you for all the edits that I'm sure are coming. Um, Cause as I was finishing the slides this morning I have other ideas as well. <laughs> so thank y'all for going with me. Um, I think that is all I'm gonna say unscripted and we're gonna get into it. Um, yeah. So I am going to share screen in a particular kind of way that I learned how to do last night. Um, okay. So um, the title of my dissertation is, but what does it mean to the people who matter? Community partner meaning making and engineering engagement programs. Um, I am doing this dissertation as a, um, a PhD in engineering education at Purdue, um, but this study was also uh, a part of my master's degree from Purdue in industrial engineering. Um, and like I already mentioned, my advisors are Dr. Monica Cardella and Dr. Brent Jessic. So if you don't already know me, I am a lot of things, um, but today we're here to talk about me being a researcher. Um, I have my undergrad degree in industrial engineering, um, which contributes to like the systemic way that I think about education. Um, but my passion for education came way before I even wanted to be an engineer. Um, so I'm really excited to be presenting this work today because I feel like my PhD in engineering education really allowed me to explore the nuances between technology and the way people develop that technology, but also the way the people who develop that technology are developed. Um, I appreciate <laughs> so much the fact that I've been able to answer questions around how engineers are developed, um, around how the people who change the world think about the world. Um, so today might be a little meta. I'm just letting y'all know that now. Um, a lot of my interest in engineering education comes out of a, a desire to explore how people are making sense of engineering and how it happens, who gets to, who gets to play, who gets to be involved. Um, and if I had more time, the pictures above me would probably be of my family and friends and my clients and my stakeholders that I work with in my regular life as an entrepreneur, as an artist, um, because I think a lot of my inspiration comes from just appreciating the way that they move in the world, appreciating the way that they survive and navigate, um, and also wanting to better support and articulate what they're doing. Um, engineering education has allowed me to do that in a really interesting way. So this is our agenda for the day. I'm gonna talk us through a background of the problem I decided to address, then talk through the literature and some of the frameworks that are related to that problem. Then I'm gonna try, try to describe the study that I created around that problem and the methodology I used and also the way that I analyze, analyze the data. Then I'm gonna talk about the findings that came from that data uh, analyzing um, and then go into some discussion of what this might mean um, for engineering education and for the way that we think about um, community partners. If you know me, you know that I talk fast um, and I'm gonna try my best to not talk fast, um, but also the nature of the study is huge and I don't have that much time. So we're gonna be moving fast. Um, I'm telling you that now so that you don't feel like you should be able to catch everything, um, but also 
to remind you that this is being recorded. So if anything is super interesting, you can come back and see it later. Um, Cause you know, everything might not be able to make it into the comment session right now, but this is a growing document and I really, really, really need feedback, right? So if something comes up and you're like, oh, that's interesting, but you don't have time to process it when it comes up, please make a note um, and hit me up about it afterwards. All right, so let's get into it. Um, the background of this work really comes from um, the fact that I wanted to be an engineer because engineers can change the world. Engineering was presented to me as a method to um, improve society, but fundamentally also to change society. Um, as I got into engineering, I started looking up what the intention of engineering is and engineering education at Purdue provides a really strong framework into the history and philosophy behind how engineering came to be. Um, and behind how engineering education became, came to be. Um, I tried to summarize my <laughs> understanding of that on this slide. Um, engineering is the application of scientific principles to design or develop structures, mechanisms, and other apparatuses to advance the human condition and thus serve society. That's incredible. That's almost a superpower, very Iron Man, Wakanda, you know, doom like. Um, as I started getting interested in changing the world, I realized that what part of the world that people would change depended on where they were coming from. I realized people's ability to be an engineer depended on a lot of factors that happen at their institution on a local level. I know for me, it had a lot to do with programs and support. Um, so I got really interested in the way engineers were educated and the way that um, that degree and that experience was used to kind of gatekeep who had access to what types of change. And as I looked into that in my first few years at my PhD, I realized that, um, Educating engineers is really complicated. <laughs> it's not a simple thing. And I'm not going to even try to go into all the different theories and ways that we could talk about doing it. Um, but I do know, as it relates to um, the idea of serving society, even the biggest institutions that help engineers figure out how to be accredited don't really know the best ways to approach um, serving society. What I'm trying to say is that um, ABED, which is an organization that accredits engineering de departments across the United States for sure, and maybe across the world, um, they have these criteria that they use to help universities to understand if their curriculum is really creating um, what engineers need to be to serve society. And in 2019, they released a, another um, update to their criteria to further outline some specifics on the, the past criteria they had. And one of the things that they mentioned was uh, the, the addition of what you see here in orange. They were trying to make explicit that engineering programs not only need to be doing what they've been doing in terms of educating engineers around the technical side of things, but they also needed to be able to apply engineering design to solutions that meet specified needs with consideration for public health and safety welfare, as well as for global, cultural, and social, environmental, and economic factors. That's even more complicated, right? So what, what you see here is that engineering itself is complicated, edu educating engineers is complicated, and even as we try to do that, we very recently are making more explicit how we're doing that for our communities, right? That surf society piece is not a simple thing to do. So as I, uh oh my mouse, did my mouse just, yeah, my mouse just died. I knew there was going to be something. All right, um, so as engineers attempt to address problems that are more and more social, the task of scoping and defining the problem really becomes a function of how much research and engagement can we have with those stakeholders, right? So if educating engineers is complicated, and if we're trying to educate engineers towards the goal of being able to meet needs of society, how we do that is really based on how well we talk to society, right? So if we wanna do that, we have to really get in touch with what people are going through and how they define their problems. Mouse is gone. We're up here now. Um, defining what part of society that you want to deal with is something that engineers um, have down to a science. Um, and the idea is really wrapped around this concept of stakeholders. Um, stakeholders are defined as someone who is affected by um, anything that is designed, but also the process of its creation or the distribution in life of that creation. Um, the cool thing about 2020 and 2021 is that we have been seeing engineers starting to address this idea of the end life, right? This idea of trying to think about the afterlife and the unintended consequences of the work that they do. 
um, but there still is an art articulated need to better understand what the stakeholder experience is overall, right? Including the end life, including the process, including the cultural context around that eventual design artifact. In engineering education, um, community engagement usually takes the form of a lot of active and experiential programs where students are working with people in the community. Um, and they're addressing a really articulated um, and tangible need in the community. When I came into engineering, I thought this was like the coolest part of my curriculum is that like a fourth of my coursework was really project-based. It wasn't necessarily answering questions, um, but it was answering questions for people in the community. And this is something that um, is not new in engineering engagement, sorry, it's not new in engineering. Um, and it shows up in a lot of different ways with a lot of different names, right? So it might be called service learning. Um, I just described community engagement, um, but the specific pedagogy or the way that those programs are set up is usually described as project-based service learning because essentially um, what educators have to do is this, define an experience for community partners that won't just be good for the community partners, but also will create some type of learning for the student. Um, and the study of how that's done is usually described as project-based service learning, which is really cool. Um, but if you think about the fact that these settings require a real world problem, um, the people who experience those problems are integral to those spaces. So as much as engineering educators are interested in these spaces because we wanna make sure that we're serving the community and that we are achieving learning outcomes for students, um, as much as that might be our goal, in order for us to reach that goal, we need people with real problems, right? Um, and a lot of times what happens is we are trying to create experiences for our students to have empathy for a, for a stakeholder or for our students to take perspective of a stakeholder but we don't necessarily consider their perspective as we design the space, right? We're not necessarily considering how we're engaging with them and that as, a, as another moment of the community partner experience. As I looked um, into this, it became really um, apparent to me that this is something that needed to be investigated. Um, so the purpose of my study is really to investigate what is the experience of community partners by answering this research question. What meanings do community partner make of their experiences in engineering engagement programs? I know this all seems very simple, um, but when you're getting a PhD, nothing is simple. Um, so every part of this, I had to understand and break down um, what has been happening currently in the literature related to engagement programs, but also what does meaning mean, right? If my research question is what meanings the community partners make, to answer that question, I have to have some type of framework for how meaning is made. Um, so now we're gonna get into the literature and the stuff that I have to do to try to figure out how to answer this question. Um, luckily, engineering education at Purdue um, has been doing a lot, well, engineering in general at Purdue has been doing a lot um, in the space of engineering engagement. Um, Brent Jessick, sorry, Julia Thomas Thompson and Brent Jessick published something in 2017 that talks about um, the nature of partnerships in these, in these programs and really starts to look at not just the student understanding and experience of those settings, but what is the community partner um, experience of those partnerships, right? And how do, how do the structures of those programs affect the way that the nature of those relationships develop, right? And that's really interesting. And it starts to give us a picture of what engineer, so, sorry, what community partners are experiencing. Um, there are other, other frameworks that just came out also from Purdue by Paul uh, Ledwick, who is here, hey, and um, Professor Art Oaks. And this framework is really cool because it actually starts to break out um, what are the different components of project-based community engagement? And what they talk about is, um, this idea that the process kind of contains all these different stakeholders and each stakeholder has an interaction with the deliverable and each other that creates the experience. I know this sounds a little meta, but for engineering en engagement, this is actually kind of groundbreaking because we haven't necessarily had um, something that visualized the fact that all these many pieces were happening. Um, what we have had was this model uh, that talks about constituents of, en of engagement programs this isn't necessarily based out of engineering, um, but it investigates service learning and civic engagement in general. And it created this model that talks about the students, the organization, the faculty and administrators, um, but also the residents of the community. And this model is pretty cool because um, it gives you a picture of not just the, the, um, the program itself, but also the community residents. But if you take a look at this, oh, sorry, this way, if you take a look at this model, um, you see that the students, the faculty, the administrators, the community residents, and the community organizations all get their own node in this model, right? So this model says that these are the six or five uh, parts of this experience. 
But it's really hard to elucidate what the community partner's experience might be because the community partner is not necessarily the same thing as a community organization, right? The community partner might work for the organization. The community partner might also be a community resident or they might not be, right? And I identified that as a gap because we really don't know what's happening in, the, in that upper bubble or where the community partner might be. Um, I wasn't the only person who identified this gap uh, after, I wanna say sometime in June, this paper was published um, and it was a systemic lit review of community engagement programs in engineering from 1980 to 2019, which was incredible because your girl was not trying to do a systemic lit review. <laughs> um, but what it said was the community partner still remains a less, a less studied subject of researchers, right? Further identifying that this is a gap that we need to understand. Um, but how are we going to address that gap, right? If we know that we don't know how community partners are there, what can we really do for that? And then I had to understand, like, what is meaning, right? If I'm trying to figure out what their experiences are, how do I give language to that? How do I describe the way that they have experienced, ex experienced these studies? Um, and because I come from an education background, I know that meaning is intricately tied with learning and intricately tied with the way that we make sense of the world. So I didn't just want a theoretical concept of meaning. I wanted a theoretical framework that would allow me to speak to the learning um, that might be happening as meaning is made. And luckily a framework like that existed. Um, Zatan and Brinkman presented a study for meaning making that builds on um, Dewey and Bruner who are um, really well supported and understood um, uh, scholars in learning development. Um, and what they did was they established this framework that has three different levels of meaning that people make. Um, those levels were semantic, pragmatic, and existential. There we go. Um, and as meta as it sounds, it's exactly what it sounds like. So semantic is about language and the way people that, the way that people organize their shared words and their ways of thinking. Pragmatic meanings are associated with people's practice and the way that they engage prag pragmatically with each other. Um, and then existential, existential are things that are related to a larger social context or a larger journey, right? And what Zatan and Brinkman are saying is that as people make meaning in the world, their meaning tends to fall into these categories, right? Sometimes it's related to the language and the meaning or thinking and communication. Sometimes it's just related to the doing and the being. And other times it's related to this larger journey and larger context of what that, um, what that meaning might be situated in. Um, so once I had those frameworks and had different languages to kind of understand um, what the community partner experience might be, I then de designed a study to answer my research question. Um, because my research question was around the experiences of community partners, um, I chose a qualitative research methodology which essentially uh, attempts to answer questions about people's lives, the cultural context and, and the reasons and the ways that they do what they do. Um, I chose to interview three different community partners from three different programs, um, from three different engineering engagement programs. The first partner, um, her pseudonym is Tony, and she was a part of a engineering engagement program that was focused on academic development um, and also skill build building. Her engagement program was actually a semester long program um, and the whole project was encapsulated within that semester. Um, the focus of the project was on the design process and the community partners problem. And the students that she worked with, it was a group of, of about four, uh, four of them and they met every week. Uh, the next community partner I talked to, her pseudonym is, her pseudonym is Yasmin. Um, her class focused on community service and the design process and her project actually extended beyond the length of that semester, right? So though I talked to her within the semester and the students experienced the class as a semester, the project itself was ongoing as a part of a larger initiative by the university. They still focus on the design process. She still had a group of about four students, but in that program, she met with her students about once a month. Um, so Tony met every week with her students. Yasmin met once, yeah, Yasmin met once a month. And my final community partner is Tiffany. Um, her class actually focused on systems thinking. And though the class itself was a semester long, her project and interaction with the students actually only took about three weeks. Um, the project focus was on systems thinking and her problem and her group was a little bit bigger. So she had five to six, five to six students in her group. I think one person um, ended up, uh, I can't remember exactly what happened to that sixth person. Um, anyway, but she interacted with her students bi-weekly. Um, so in a three week program, that essentially means she met with them twice, once at the beginning and once in the middle and once at the end. 
Um, I chose these partners because I wanted to understand um, their experience. And I knew that asking people about their experience meant that you had to create some type of relationship with them. So I didn't necessarily want to go in spaces that I had no existing connection with. And these partners were all, um, let's go this way this time. These partners were all community partners that were um, involved in programs that I already was doing some work in. So Tony was a, bar, a part of a program that was in a class that I was actually helping to coordinate and doing research around. Um, Yasmin was in a class that I was doing research on and Tiffany was actually in a class that I was a grader for and doing research on. So they already had seen me in some context and there was some pre-existing context for us to have these conversations. Um, I chose to do semi-structured interviews because I wanted to be able to ask open-ended questions and make sure I could uh, let the community partner kind of tell me about the meaning they were making. Um, and I interviewed my community partners three times before, during, and after their participation in the program. Um, here are some sample questions that I asked them. Initially, when we first met, I wasn't able to ask them too much. So the interview protocols kind of got longer as we went. Um, the first protocol was really about um, what are you expecting? Tell me a little bit more about your, about your role and how, how you think this will go. The middle one was about um, kind of touching base on what their work with the experience had been like, sorry, their work with the students had been like so far, um, but also how they would describe the work in their relationships. And then at the end, I got to ask them even more questions around um, the difference between what they are expecting and what they got, what surprised them and those type of things. Just keep looking at the wrong mouse. Um, all these interviews were conducted um, both over the phone and in person, um, but data was collected through audio recording. Um, once I had those audio recordings, they were transcribed using Timmy.com, and then those transcribes, those, those transcripts were analyzed using a website called Mural.com. Um, to analyze my data, I had to do a few rounds of things because qualitative data is words, and words take a lot of time to systemically understand, right? So because this is not a quantitative study, um, I had to use a lot of different methods that allowed me to um, see what meaning was there and be able to map that back to what the community partners were saying. Um, so my data analysis took two steps, um, but both of those steps have steps inside of them. Um, the first step was doing descriptive open coding, and the second step was doing thematic coding. For the first step, I was coding for the voice of the community partner, and I was just looking for what was being described. When I say coding, I mean I go back to the transcripts and look at the, the, um, what the community partners have said, and I find quotes. Um, this is a quote from Tony, I believe. Um, she here, right here, she's describing um, how she decided to join the program. And she says, I went to my colleague and I said, you know, do you think we can come up with a project that might work for this? And the Sirewide project was something that we worked on last year. So those are our, our, were kind of our two ideas. So once I saw this quote, I then had to put a descriptive quote on it, which is pretty much just saying what meaning, sorry, not what meaning, what is she saying in this quote, All right? So she's just describing the process of collaborating with a coworker to develop this project idea, All right? So she said she went to talk to somebody and they figured out um, they had a project last year that might work. So this was the first round of coding that I had to uh, repeat for all partners and for all interviews. Um, and then once I had those codes, I reviewed the quote and tried to see Sorry, once I had those quote and codes, I reviewed that to see how it mapped to the theoretical framework, right? So now that I know what they're saying, um, what does that mean in terms of the meeting that they're making? This was a little bit more um, involved. So first I had to look at the descriptive quote and ask what meaning are the community partner making? Um, so from the quote we just had, um, I said that, sorry, the descriptive quote was that she's collaborating with a coworker. So the meaning there that she might be making is, well, first, in order to engage, I should probably check with my coworker. And second, this EEP needs, needs a project that's already in the works, right? So in this step right here, I'm doing interpretation. I'm looking at both my quote and the descriptive code to say what meaning is the community partner making in this quote? Sorry, in this quote, yes. Um, and then once I have that meaning, I need to think about um, what part of the theoretical framework, if any, do those meanings map to? How could I classify that meaning? For this example, if we go back to the theoretical framework, um, because she's talking about things that she's doing, right? So she went to go check with her colleague um, and this project, this engagement in this requires work that's already done. Um, this was coded as pragmatic, um, but I had to repeat this process for all of the interviews um, and ended up with a lot of different descriptive codes and 
tags. Um, I then categorized those across those interviews um, and found a few different categories, which we're gonna talk about shortly. Um, but after I repeated that, I then had to go through um, and inside of those categories, see what the things were across all of these uh, types of meaning. Um, what this gave me was findings like this. <laughs> uh, so under each type of meaning, I found different themes of the meanings that community partners were making. Um, they made a lot of pragmatic meaning, as you can see, a little bit of semantic meaning, some existential meaning, and actually a few types of meanings that were not just one or the other, but were both. Um, we're gonna go through these now. So these are the themes under the pragmatic meaning. Community partners here talked about their role. They talked about the student contributions. They talked about the way that their organization experienced, influenced the EEP. Um, they also talked about the way that their benefits were um, manifesting and the way that the students' benefits might be manifesting, right? So the community partners were not just um, talking about what was done, but they were also thinking about the pragmatic benefits of being involved. For semantic meaning, um, they talked a lot about the way that communication happened um, and the way that that communication um, led to other things within the EEP. Uh, they had a lot to say about the student perspective and the way that that, think, that perspective was helpful or not helpful for the work that they were doing. Um, and they also described the way that they thought through the solutions, right? And sometimes how that thinking differed from the way the students thought about the problems. Um, there also was some examples of existential meetings. Um, so community partners talked about their understanding of the larger context of their stakeholders. Um, Yasmin in particular often talked about the way that um, the work the students were doing was connected to her larger organization's mission, right? And so she had this, this layer of understanding that the students weren't necessarily um, engaging with. Um, they also, the community partners were also able to make speculations around um, how this EEP might contribute to the student's larger tra trajectory, right? So this is not necessarily um, how the student skills are manifesting right now, um, but how doing this program will help the students in the future, right? So the community partners are actually thinking around this space in a lot of different ways. Um, some of that meaning, um, like I said, was overlapping. The two, that, the two things that arose for the over overlapping meanings were um, related to communication that initiates action, and then learning by doing or doing something in order to think about it. Um, these two overlapping meanings came from overlaps between pragmatic and semantic, where community partners will be talking about things or making um, or explaining things that um, make connections between talking and doing or thinking and being or learning and doing, right? So these meanings I thought were really interesting because they want to expand the framework a little bit, but also uh, give a little bit more nuance to the way the community partners are navigating. Once I had understood these um, findings, I then had to connect those findings back to the literature um, in my discussion section. Um, I want to give you now some examples of the findings and how those things showed up in the literature. Um, so this is an example of one of the pragmatic findings. Um, finding number five was that participation in the EEP uh, was related to their role in the organization. Tiffany in particular, she described that her role in the organization had an audience of advisors and faculties that often referred students to resources. Um, this related to her project because her project was all around student awareness about resources. Um, and essentially what she's saying here is that being involved in this project was helpful because her role has the ability to affect people who can affect this, right? So she's making a connection between her role and the work um, and this speaks to Tiffany making meaning around the potential to be able to provide stronger services for her organization, um, which is something that's already documented in literature, um, but also um, the potential for this deliverable to really have some contribution to our organization, right? Which speaks to the model that uh, Ledwix and Oaks, Oaks developed that talks about the way that the deliverable informs the um, community partners and the stakeholders in that space. My grandma just joined the waiting room. Moving on. Um, oh, I forgot I had an easier way to see that. All right, so an example from some of my semantic findings. Um, finding number two was that community partners um, have perspective of the way the students think. Yasmin commented that her students needed to um, push the boundaries of their thinking outside of the box. So here Yasmin is describing some 
limitations to student thinking. Um, and this is outlined in the literature, um, specifically the PACE study talks about how community partners sometimes engage in these programs because they want new perspectives and new energy on the stuff that they've been doing. Um, an example from the existential bucket, um, the first finding was that community partners make speculations around the larger context of stakeholders. Um, and Yasmin, again, she says, anything I can do, sorry, anything I can get involved in that moves the, the needle for the deaf community is worth my time. So here Yasmin is saying that the engineering engagement program problem is worth her time because it aligns with her stakeholders. Um, this connects to the idea that, the motiv that her motivation to participate um, is related to the, her organization's mission. Um, and this is something that Bassinger and Bartholomew will describe as fulfilling service learning objectives, um, something that we have seen in the literature, um, but I'm not necessarily in engineering literature though. Um, I gotta remember not <laughs> to lean over. Um, I did want to give you an example from the overlap. However, the overlap is a little bit harder to describe. So first, I wanted to give you um, an example of how the overlap was coded, and then we'll talk about the discussion of it. Um, so here is a quote that I thought was both pragmatic and semantic. Tony says, I'm thinking that we'll share the students' presentation with our internal team. They've communicated things in a way that, that make work with the stakeholders easier. Sorry, that make work with some stakeholders e easier. So this meaning was coded as pragmatic and semantic because she describes student communication, which is semantic, in terms of further action um, with the stakeholders, which is pragmatic. Um, these mean, this meaning suggests that communication itself has a direct impact on the deliverables, um, oops, I thought there was more, which tells us that um, communication itself might be able to serve as possibly another um, node in these settings, right? Communication itself might be something that is um, interacting as a, a part of this process. And we'll talk about that more in my implications. Um, just as a summary, our research question was, what meaning do community partners make in these settings? And we found that they made a lot of meanings, um, a lot that fit within it, with a lot that fit inside of the framework for, the, for meaning making, um, but some that overlapped that, that framework as well. And this has some interesting implications. Um, the first implication is that it is possible to expand the way that we have these frameworks set up currently. Um, some of the frameworks that we have do an amazing job of starting to situate where stuff is happening, um, but my findings indicate that there might be additional nodes and additional relationships that might provide a richer understanding of how those spaces are being experienced. Um, my second finding is that there's a potential to more deeply engage our community partners um, because the community partners in this study described a lot of meaning related to the students' experience, the students' skills, the students' um, larger trajectory. And oftentimes those, that type of um, reflection and assessment is not um, something that community partners are responsible for, right? So community partners are usually giving feedback on um, the students' product um, and maybe some of their skills within the, the context of the EEP. But these studies, sorry, these partners actually talked about um, seeing the student in a larger light, right? And maybe we can engage community partners more deeply in the way that they assess students and the way that they participate. Um, my last finding is an, is an opportunity to, deeply, to more deeply investigate communication and thinking between students and community partners. Like I was saying, community partner, sorry, communication surfaced in the study many times as something that was negotiated, something that changed, something that initiated action, something that created learning. Um, and I think, this points to a need to better um, specifically look at that element, um, to look at communication, thinking, and um, the way that those things might experience, might support the community partner experience, but also might affect the student, the way that the students are learning. Because it seems like the community partner communication about those things are, are contributing to the student learning as well. Um, so in terms of the way that we expand those frameworks, uh, one suggestion that I have is to make the community partner its own node inside of our frameworks. Um, so to not assume that the community partner and the community organization are the same, um, but to actually center them in their um, experience as someone that has to negotiate relationships with all these people, right? So that suggests the addition of these five new relationships in the SOFAR framework and actually kind of makes the model look a little bit like the model that we have for the cultural hackathon where the process is centered around the community partner. But I didn't notice that until now. So we'll talk about that later committee. <laughs> Other frameworks that could be expanded, uh, this framework, which is amazing. Uh, I'm really excited to play around with um, how this research might inform what this framework looks like. Um, the, this framework from Letwick and Oaks uh, has a lot of space in it for other stakeholders, a broader society, 
in my study indicated that local stakeholders do in fact play a role in the study, um, sorry, a role in the experience, um, but also that the process plays its own role. So I think that this framework does a good job of kind of giving us a place to start poking around, um, but it doesn't give us a lot of places, sorry, it doesn't give make it easy for us to talk about um, the needs in this process, right? And the weight that these different nodes might have on how these things happen, right? So when these things are um, happening in real life, sometimes though the stakeholder might exist, they actually don't have much of an influence, right? So maybe that maybe there's only error going one way. Um, also, like I said earlier, communication in and of itself might be an additional note that we want to add to this framework or to frameworks in general. Um, I love that this framework centers the deliverable because it allows you to have a very like easy way to see how things are happening. Um, but I think communication can be worked in there as its own um, uh, layer because it seems like who gets to communicate and how uh, affects a lot of the experience of the community partner. Um, which also affects the way that the students are learning. And that kind of leads to um, a desire to, to better and more deeply understand their relationships and power dynamics. Um, and I think this framework is set up to help us do that, like they say in the paper. Um, we can use this to continue to continue to expand how these things happen and how we how we engage those. Um, so as we continue to do a more nuanced investigation into the roles that community partners play in these settings, I think we'll continue to understand more about how these things function. Um, but my study also calls for a deeper engagement of how the community partner's perspective um, is engaged. So there's a space to, to give, um, to create more channels for feedback between the student and the community partners, because it's clear from this study, at least, um, from, for, the find, for the participants that I had, that um, they are, the community partners are making meaning around what the student's needs are, right? And what their larger journey is, um, how the, the work that they're doing on a micro basis um, is contributing to what the students might go on to be, right? And I think that is an opportunity for us to give the students even more richer feedback, but also for us to give the community partner more voice in these spaces. Um, community partners in this study also describe learning as a function of having participated in the EEP. Um, and this is despite the fact that most literature on their learning, uh, sorry, that most literature doesn't look at their learning, right? Most literature right now on engineering engagement programs looks at the learning of students, um, but community partners in this study describe having learned as being a part of it. Um, so this implicates an opportunity more, to more deeply investigate how this participation co contributes to learning, um, but also what that experience of learning might be, right? Because the community partners are obviously coming with some type of um, uh, social capital or cultural context that is allowing them to learn even without us investigating it. Um, so I would love to investigate that more. Um, also, the study indicates that the student, oh, I said that already. Um, but I think this idea of thinking about the larger student's journey um, is something that engineering engagement programs try to teach the students um, and try to make sure the students understand that their experiences in these programs are not just one-off things, but are things that they should practice in the future. Um, and it seems like community partners are making meaning around that as well, right? They're making connections to how um, specific experiences, specific meetings are allowing students to develop confidence, are allowing students to speak up more over time. Um, and I think we can investigate more the way that the, the community partner conceives of the students, because um, I think that might give us another, a lo another level and another way to appreciate what students are doing, but also, like I said, to appreciate the voice of the community partners. Um, and the last implication around communication and thinking, uh, findings from my study in implicate like I've said so many times, that communication has a direct impact on deliverables, right? Communication is a means of learning for the community partner and also a means of facilitating learning for the students. Um, the community partners also have this longer term perspective of their work and they think about things in a way that really contributes to um, the student experience of this, right? This implicates a potential need to more deeply investigate this, um, especially the conversations and communications that happen between students and community partners, because there's a lot of, um, very interesting learning by doing a lot of um, very interesting skill, skill sets that the community partners use. So overall, um, my study implicates a need, a need to further investigate community partner experiences of engineering and get a pro engineering engagement programs and to begin assessing the gap in literature associated with their experiences. As I did the study, there are of course some limitations. Um, though I chose my methodology to answer my research question, um, as I did the study, I realized that it might have been helpful to have more information about the programs themselves and how the structure of those programs might have affected each of the community partners' meaning. Um, so in the future, 
Um, it's possible that a case study analysis of participant experiences and programs might better show us what the nature of those programs might be and how that affects community partners. Um, so I'm thinking a study that looks at community partners in one program and really starts to understand how those things happen might help address some of those um, limitations of this study. Um, also, the fact that I collected data as an audio recording um, was useful because it allowed me to hear what the community partners were saying, to hear some of the intonations and how they, and the pauses that they made, um, but did have some limitations in terms of things like body language and context, right? So unless I remembered exactly what her face looked like when she said it, as I was analyzing this data, I wasn't necessarily able to interpret um, the full context of the, the conversation that was happening. Um, so in the future, studies, studies that I do or studies like this um, can use video analysis or even observations to better get a, a picture of what meanings and experiences community partners might have. Oops, gave it away. Something there, right? Mm, okay. So overall, as we design spaces for engineering students to solve the world's problems, we need to prioritize investigating those experiences. Um, sorry, we need to prioritize investigating experiences of those who face those problems and their contributions to those problem spaces from their perspective. Um, I think this is something that we've started seeing in our industry. We've started seeing, especially in 2020 and 2021, an increased focus on things like human-centered design um, and making sure that we're incorporating our stakeholders, not just in the end product, but in the development of the program and the development of the grant. Um, those type of participatory um, type of action engagements, I think, are really us trying to more deeply see things from their perspective, right, and not necessarily um, continue to understand these, these spaces in terms of student learning, in terms of um, just our educational outcomes, but to better reach this overall goal of, of trying to really affect change in the world. Um, that is all that I have. If you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to email me. Um, and I would love your feedback on this. If you're having any thoughts or reactions, any sources you think I should see, please go to this website. Um, I can drop it in the chat in a second or you can screenshot or take a picture of the um, QR code and it'll take you to a website where you can give me feedback. Please, please do that because it really is helpful. Um, the last thing I wanna say before I open myself up for questions um, is another thank you to everyone who sat through this presentation, um, but a deeper thank you to my community partners and the participants of the study who really allow me to start seeing the world this way. Um, a deeper thank you as well to my real life community partners, my real life um, designers and people who keep me inspired, um, people who keep me engaging and listening to the perspective of people. Um, and I think that is it. Oh, the last thing I want to say um, was to make sure that as we are doing your work, even if you're not an engineer, even if this is not something that you do regularly, um, make sure that you're thinking about the perspective of the people you serve, right? That might be your customers, that might be your family, that might be your students, that might be, you know, your clients, however you think about that. I think a lot of the stuff we talked about here today um, speaks to the way that we can more better, more better, <laughs> the way that we can um, more truly listen to the perspectives of the people we're trying to serve, right? And not just serve them in our language um, and not just serve them in our context, but really start to get feedback on how things are emerging for them. I'm gonna stop talking. I think that's it. Oh, I forgot about that. Um, there's an amazing project happening around me if you want to start communicating, start helping organizations around you. Um, the Joy Project is doing some really amazing things here in Detroit and um, they're running a fundraiser right now. So screenshot that, send them a dollar. If you wanna love on me for my dissertation, go to the Joy Project. Thank y'all for coming. You know, I'm gonna be quiet now. <laughs> All right, thank you, Chanel. Um, so please, if you want to add um, any uh, congratulations or clapping in the chat or use the Zoom reactions, let's um, show appreciation for Chanel for sharing her work with us this morning. Um, and then at the same time, also we welcome any questions that you have. You can either put them in the chat or I think you should be able to unmute yourself now if you'd like to ask a question.
Um, so I'll just say again, thank you, Chanel, for sharing your work with us this morning. Um, also for everyone in the audience, um, I also want to extend my thanks for you not only being here today, but I know that all of you have been um, a support to Chanel um, throughout her time as a PhD student, as well as many of you have been a support for her much, much beyond that. Um, so, so thank you for your, your love and your support of Chanel, and thank you for being here this morning. Um, it looks like Dinesh, you have a question. Sorry, I've been fighting with my kid to press the button uh, for a while. <laughs> she says her congratulations and all that's amazing work. Um, I just had a quick thought and less of a question, um, but as you were presenting your findings and your uh, suggestion towards the end, it's so useful. And I think it's so critical about rethinking and reforming how we think about community engagement and university community partnerships. Um, I was wondering, because like from your research and all the experiences that the community partners shared, it sounds like they want to have a more active role uh, and engagement in, in the formation of those partnerships and engagement. Uh, so I was wondering, I mean, in the last slide here, you're presenting that as we design spaces for engineering students to solve and I'm thinking, um, should the community partners play a role in the design too? Uh, so, so it's not just like engineering education is designing it, but um, the community partners are also designing the way that we think about learning for our students uh, in those partnerships. So it's uh, one more maybe layer of collaboration. I know it's very complex given the systemic challenges uh, that exists from institutions and universities, but um, that was just a reflection as you presented. It sounds like you have amazing data to to supplement or support yeah. that. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think one thing that I'm working on, and I think we're going to continue to work on it, is um, what I think this data is really saying. Um, it's not necessarily saying that we should definitely involve community partners in literally everything that we do as educators. Um, but it is saying that community partners are doing a lot more than we thought. And like you were saying, it's possible for us to involve them into the design of these spaces. It's possible for us to involve them into the way that they're assessed. Um, it's possible for us to even involve them into the way that the problem and the, and the project itself might be set up. Um, because you're like, like you're saying, um, they have, they deal with these things in real life, you know, and we know that as educators, which is why I think we do what we do and why I think we set up these spaces in the first place. Um, but it's often really hard when you do things as a profession to see how that profession um, is experienced um, and see how that, how that profession creates boundaries and creates um, the need to, to think about who, who gets involved in a conversation at what point. You know, thank you for that. Give the baby an extra kiss for me. So that baby is probably as old as my dissertation is. And then Hoda's baby is as old as my I am as a researcher, if y'all want any context. Um, that baby, I think, was around the time that my proposal started making sense. So that's how old my project is. <laughs> well, I'm glad she's there to listen to you today. Yeah, so. look at her moving around on her own. She's so, every time I see her, she's doing more and more. Give love to Nevi to me too, for me too. Well, thank you, Chanel. Amazing work. I'm so excited. Other questions? Maybe while we're waiting to see if anyone else has a question, I'm realizing I forgot to um, acknowledge and, and thank Chanel's other committee members who have supported her along the way and are here today. So also we want to thank um, Dr. Ruth Strevler, Dr. Stephanie Matza, and Dr. Daryl Dickerson. So thank you to the three of you. I cannot wait to write my acknowledgments. <laughs> it's going to get published at his own, as his own poetry book. <laughs> Other questions? I see a question in the chat around late stage capitalism. Um, I appreciate this question. Um, so late stage capitalism is essentially um, what happens after capitalism gets to do what it do its thing for a couple hundred years. Um, and the question is, 
the nature of late stage capitalism can't be addressed within the closed educational system. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, and how I'm interpreting that question is, um, how do I think that the nature of capitalism can be addressed from inside of education? Or how do I think um, this work speaks to that? Somebody unmute this up. Did you want to? Oh, that's not, that's not grandma. Hey, grandma. Um, so, unmute grandma. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, I think that's a good point. Um, one of the things that I struggled with in the, in the process of writing this document was really trying to keep it grounded in what mattered to me and what I really thought the implications were saying um, and where the implications were within the educational context. Um, I don't necessarily think that education itself can disrupt what's happening with late stage capitalism. Um, however, I do think that as a society, we underestimate the role that educational education plays in the development of very capitalistic people. Um, and I think there are ways to, to leverage the way that we educate engineers to affect 20 years from now where, cap, cap, where capitalism will be. But I also think there are ways through programs like engineering engagement programs for us to leverage the existing power that these institutions have in that late stage capitalism, right? So I don't necessarily think educating students will do a lot in the short term for that, but I do think if we start doing our current engagement with different programs differently, um, that will mean that our current partners who are these really big capitalistic companies have to hear and interact with that in some way. Um, and that can have some present day effects. One short example, um, is really what you're seeing now as a function of the pandemic and as a function of the worker shortage and what engineering has to do to kind of make stuff make sense. Um, late stage capitalism is now in a place where it is financially beneficial to care about people. Um, that has not always been the case. And usually trying to you know, affect the position of the marginalized from inside of a system doesn't work very well because there isn't a really good reason for the system to pay attention to the marginalized. However, when society collapses, every, everything has a reason to pay attention to the marginalized, right? Because there are less people, therefore we wanna keep our people safe. We wanna keep them healthy. Um, people are also, you know, more voiceless now. So we want them to stay, stick around a little bit. Um, so what that's created, I think in industry is an open ear for best practices and the ways that things can be done. Um, and what I think that means is that education, even as a closed system can do some things for late stage capitalism, right? Educators can do something around the way that they set up their programs around the way that they write their grants, around the way that they engage their students, um, that might affect the way that these companies are then able to get their, their talent, right? Because we actually, as, as an academic system, as much as we're not the same as the industry, we feed the industry, right? They do need people. They need students and they want students who are educated well, um, and they want students who are educated in a certain kind of way. And if we leverage the fact that they're looking to us for that, and in our work and in our practices start being more human centered, that modeling and those boundaries will trickle down. And what you're seeing now is a lot more uh, footwork behind diversity and inclusion efforts because of that type of engagement. You're seeing more footwork and more actual um, change by these big companies now because they have to, and it is now getting baked into their executive level. Um, and that is, I think, a powerful opportunity that most educators don't see because educators are trained to see themselves as just kind of a facilitator um, and not necessarily somebody who has a lot of power in affecting society outside of the student, right? Which I think is why when you look at research in this area, most of the research looks at student because as educators, that's what we have the most control over, right? But I think what my study is saying is, is that we also have this bigger um, space that we can be playing in, this bigger thing that's happening um, with these other people that we're in, in, interacting with already right now. I know, right? Alyssa, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> so happens when you get a good night's sleep. <laughs> other questions? Grandma, you look beautiful. I saw your camera on. Never been so normal right. in my life. <laughs> no. um, I think if there aren't any other questions, we will shift then and ask um, our beautiful audience if they would mind leaving the Zoom call. 
actually, so can we talk. Ask them, yeah. can we ask them to go to a different room? If you do want to talk, there's another link you can use, but you do have to leave this one. Um, so okay. drop you. a link in the chat. You can go over here if you like. Um, but the committee needs to talk now and think about things. Thank y'all so much. Quick question. When do we come back to the Zoom room? Or will you come and get us? Are you, Chanel, will you move to that other Zoom room? I'm going to stay. Sorry. I'm going to yep. stay in that other Zoom room. Um, and I'm going to stay in both rooms at one time. So y'all not going to come back here. This is just going to be me and my committee. And the family hour will be in my personal room. I'll be in and out of that room. And I might need to make somebody host because um, I might not be there the whole time. Sorry, I just changed the plan last minute on my committee. Cause we don't just kick y'all out, but I, I, I see y'all. So I want to give y'all somewhere to go. Um, so if you can click on the link in the chat and go to the other Zoom room um, so we can give the committee this room, that would be great. I see people still coming in. The other thing we could do is have the committee go to a breakout room. Oh, I forgot about that. I think most people are, I don't know, still my cousin. Dominic, can you go to my um, my Zoom room, my personal Zoom room? Yeah, I tried to get in there and- What did I say? I think you, you might have to like let us in. Okay, I'm gonna leave. And or- this room and come back committee. You can oh. make me a host, happy to help also let people in. Okay. Yep, I'll be over there in a second. 